let's talk about primitive obsession. We've previously touched upon primitive obsession, but we haven't really dug into it in detail. So primitive obsession is when you are using primitives to represent domain concepts, domain ideas. We'll talk about examples, but let's first talk about it on sort of the general plane. So let's start with the question, what is a domain concept? A domain concept is a concept, is an idea that belongs to the context of your application, that is specific to your setting. So if you would be building a blog, for example, then a domain object, a domain concept could be a post, it could be a comment, it could be a statistic, such as in how many comments are there on a particular post. And if you were building a library system, say, it could be books, authors, and so forth. I think you can see what I'm saying. So now we know what domain concepts are, but we also need to know what primitives are. So primitives are usually things such as ints or floats, bytes, characters, right? These very primitive data types. And in some languages, strings. But in some languages, strings are not actually primitive data types. Now, when we say primitive, in primitive obsession, my understanding is that we include things such as strings. In Ruby, we include things such as hashes. In C Sharp, we include things such as the dictionary. This is open for debate and there's a whole lot of nuances here and I can see how it could be valuable to hold the other position, to say that primitive obsession only apply to actual primitives. Because for example, because hash in Ruby is an object, you can actually inherit from hash. So some of the problems with primitive obsession disappear in a language such as Ruby. So now we know what primitives are and we know what the main concepts are. So let's think about the definition again. So the definition said that primitive obsession is when you are using primitives to represent domain concepts. So let's exemplify. Let's say that in our application, for some reason, we want to have ages. So we want to be able to represent the age of a person. And for the sake of the example, it's actually important that it's an alive person. So it's not about representing the age of a historical person that lived thousands of thousands of years ago, but calculating that person's age to today. It's not about that, right? It's about representing the age of individuals that are actually alive today. If we would represent the age with, say, an integer, then we are exercising primitive obsession. We're exhibiting primitive obsession. We are being obsessed with primitives. Think about it this way. What is the domain of possible values for integers? And what is the domain of possible values for age? If we use ints to represent ages, then suddenly anything that is a valid integer seems to be a valid age. But that's not actually true because an integer could be minus something, but it makes no sense for an age to be minus something if we're only looking at alive people. If this kind of domain type of thinking or range or uh, set of allowed values, if that sounds confusing, I highly recommend that you check out my other talk on Liskov substitution principle. It's very closely related to that. It's about thinking, I have this class, what are theoretically all of the possible configurations, all of the possible instances that I could have of this class? So in this case, if the, the range of possible values in integer differs from our domain concept and we are creating problems for ourselves, and this is what primitive obsession is trying to warn us about because suddenly we have a variable that will contain an age but we can't be sure that that age will adhere to the constraints of ageness that we have in our application that's inherent to our domain concept so something that i find particularly interesting about primitive obsession is that it's not immediately obvious that primitive obsession is a bad thing before i first learned about primitive obsession i believe i thought that making use of primitives or prioritizing the use of primitives over complex objects is a good thing simply because primitives have less dependencies if you think about it right i mean depending on a primitive having a method that depends on a string feels less heavy than having a method that depends on some kind of complex object that you've built yourself if you're accepting something of a type, then you need to know about the existence of that type. And it's very devious. If you think about the saying by Robert C. Martin, good architecture is to maximize the number of decisions not made, then not introducing another type, not introducing another class, but rather making use of a string or an int to represent something as a postal code or a phone number or a name or anything like this, may spontaneously feel like a very smart decision because you are deferring the decision. You are maximizing the number of decisions not made 
because you're not making the decision right now. You are simply coupling to a primitive and you then still have the choice of introducing a complex object in the future. But this is not entirely true. And now we've only talked about what seems like a benefit in terms of a string or an integer being less of a dependency than a complex object. But there's, there's also the concept of that if you depend on a string, then that string can't have internal dependencies. But if you depend on a complex object, then your complex object might actually have other dependencies. So when you depend on a particular object, or sorry, a particular class, if that particular class has other dependencies, they may have other dependencies that may have other dependencies and so forth. So when you're depending on a particular class, you may in fact be depending on uh, a whole series of classes, a whole tree of classes. So again, from a purely theoretical point of view, from a purely intuitive point of view, it, it seems that depending on a primitive is actually a good choice because you're reducing these dependencies. You're eliminating the possibility of depending on trees of complex objects. But as you may have guessed, of course, this is not the full story and thus primitive obsession. So here's the problem. The problem is that by coupling to a primitive rather than a complex object, you haven't actually eliminated dependency. You have hidden the dependency. You have made the dependency implicit rather than explicit. So the dependency still exists, but it's not immediately obvious to other developers or to yourself in some period of time whether at any given point in time the dependency is met or not, whether the constraints are satisfied or not. And from a machine point of view, the compiler or the interpreter can't know. So if you think about a typed language, for example, you can't know whether you've satisfied the dependencies from a type perspective, because as long as you pass it a string or an int or whatever you chose in that scenario, the compiler or the interpreter would say that it's okay. But it could of course be that your string or int in this particular scenario wasn't actually a valid name. And this is where the key lies. So again, think about the domain of possible values, the range of values that are allowed for an object for an instance instance of a type at any given time, right? G given some type. So let's say that we are talking about ages, for example, in the previous example, ages of people that are alive. If you model age as an int, then any number that is a valid int should be a valid age. But if your domain says that, okay, actually ages in this system, in this particular location, can only be positive and say below 120, right? We're taking it to kind of the extreme. But then we have constraints. We have a range of allowed values. That means that all integers that are outside this boundary, they aren't actually valid ages, but they are valid integers. So in other words, integers are not a valid proxy in this case for ages. And I'm not going to go into details about how this can cause problems because I guess you can probably see how tons of inconsistencies very easily can occur because we are passing around something that's checked against one set of requirements but should be checked against another set of requirements. We're passing around something under the mantle of being an int when in fact we should pass it around under the mantle of some more tighter constraints. So probably this kind of thinking could be used to determine whether you are primitively obsessed. I don't think that's the way to say it, but so let me put it in completely different words. If I'm pondering whether I should put something in a class, whether I should create a class for something, make it an object and use it as an object, or whether I should use a primitive. Let's use that test. Are all the values for the primitive valid values for my domain concept? I have this domain concept, say age, say name, say something completely different. And I ask myself, are all possible strings, ints, hashes, etc., valid instances of this domain concept? But as always, this is of course one perspective. You could actually argue the complete opposite of what I was arguing before about primitives being used to defer decisions being made. You could of course argue that primitives make it more difficult to change your mind later. And in that case, even if the domains of a primitive and of your domain concept have the same ranges. Even if you, given that rule, could use a primitive, so the primitive would be a valid substitute, a completely okay type to use instead of, then one could argue that you should still not use primitives. Again, based on that, if you have a class, it's easier for you to substitute that object later on. It's easier for you to change your code without modifying your code, without editing your code. Let me be more precise. It's easier to change the behavior of your program at runtime without changing it at compile time. So it's easier for you to, without rewriting your program, rewire 
configure your program. In other words, send different objects to different locations and therefore or thereby change the behavior of the program. So if you would use that kind of logic, I guess the conclusion would be if you have any reason to believe that your domain concept will require more complex logic in the future or will for some reason change its, its, its range of valid values in the future, then the cost of extracting a class, the cost of creating a class and using that class to represent the domain concept is so low that it's silly not to do it. And I think there's a lot to that argument. But to sum up, what we indeed can say is that if the domains are different, if the domain of valid values for your domain concept differs from the primitive that you have in mind, differs from the domain of valid values of the primitive that you have in mind, then using that primitive would be exercising primitive obsession. So in that case, you need, in an object-oriented language, a class. That's it. Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.